الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. So we resume بإذن الله تعالى after الصلاة after this prayer the advice a general advice to our sisters in Islam the women who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last day um, an advice inshallah ta'ala that will benefit them and also benefit others the men in terms of their responsibilities and their duties towards their uh, the women of their families and before the salah we spoke about a general instruction, a general advice, the most comprehensive advice that a person could give, and that is the advice to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that we do, and in everything that we say, and in every place that we go. And we defined and explained as uh, according to, or in, in the light of what scholars from the Salaf, the pious predecessors, and scholars who followed their way, uh, according to what they've explained, what re- what really this taqwa means. Now, in terms of specific advice that might be directed towards the Muslim woman, of course, from the definition that we gave, we can appreciate that the whole of the deen, the whole of the religion of Islam, in reality, is uh, the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal because this involves striving to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and to stay away from everything that He's forbidden. But there are some specific things that could be said in advice to a Muslim from one Muslim to another. And this depends upon the situation and the person and what is most appropriate and what is most needed at a particular time or a particular place in terms of advice that could be given. And even when we talk about uh, what the Muslim woman might benefit by in terms of advice and in terms of reminders of course there is a lot that we could exchange and and that we could contribute and it would take longer than the time that we have to really do justice to this important topic it is sufficient to know that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to apportion some of his time in the teaching of the women exclusively in order to be able to give them the time and to give them access to knowledge and to instruction. And this was upon request from the women during his time, alayhi salatu was salam, uh, which indicates or which shows us the hirs, the uh, concern and keenness, the enthusiasm that the sahabiyat, the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who were female, the concern and the keenness that they had to receive guidance and instruction and to be enlightened by Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wassalam so that they could go away and practice, put into practice what they learn. And so Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wassalam would give this time, he would apportion some of his time uh, to give uh, lessons and, and, and advice and reminders to the women. And uh, th- this happened on a regular basis, as well as upon certain occasions, Allah's Messenger والسلام, chose to address the women or to talk about women and uh, enlighten us 
as to some of the challenges and some of the things that are faced by the believing woman uh, and how she should deal with those things. And if we consider the situation, the environment and the conditions that uh, the Muslim woman finds herself, for example, our sisters in the UK, Muslim women in the West in general, and the, the, the condition of, or the situation that Muslims find themselves generally in the West, there are many things that we could point out and that we could choose to talk about. But in the limited time, just picking some of the topics and some of the areas uh, that maybe are the most important or some of the most important things that the Muslim woman striving to be successful in this life and in the hereafter as a Muslimah, as a Muslim, as a servant and worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing and striving for everything that the Muslim strives, man or woman, and that is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ultimately to be saved from al-nar, the fire, and to be admitted into al-jannah, paradise, then the Muslim woman has to concentrate and has to be reminded or keep in mind a number of matters. One of the most, th- one of the most important things uh, that concerns both Muslim men and women, and, and in particular here I emphasize the challenge facing our sisters, is one of knowledge and education upon Islam and trying to preserve the uh, I, uh, uh, the identity and personality and morals and ethics of a Muslim uh, who's in, who finds themselves in an environment that is not conducive to the development and the preservation of the Muslim identity an environment that is not conducive to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I find it, uh, or I find that it's important to remind our sisters that they should uh, regard themselves as Muslims, worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost. And that they should think of themselves and they should develop themselves and their personalities in the light of what Islam teaches us. Not in the light or not in the darkness of what the uh, values and propaganda and the culture around them teaches. The Muslim woman in the West in general, including in the UK, is faced with a very big challenge, and that is the challenge, in fact, that all of us are facing to some degree or another, and that is that uh, Islam and being Muslim and the morals and the ethics and the beliefs even that you have are now constantly being, or there's an attempt to define and to tell the Muslim what it means to be a Muslim and those who are trying to tell a person what is right and what is wrong are those who don't understand Islam, don't appreciate it, don't believe in it and those who would want the Muslim to be as they wish them to be. And this is particularly a problem or a challenge or an issue that the Muslim woman has to face. Because the Muslim woman is constantly being told or it's constantly, constantly being hinted that she is somehow wronged in Islam. 
or that she is or she has in front of her a choice where she can be free and she can have certain rights and privileges which are denied to her if she sticks to or adheres to the teachings of Islam, the teachings of the Sharia, the law and guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we only see that this will increase over time, uh, this kind of attempt to define and to dictate to Muslims what it means to be a Muslim in the West. So one of the most important and honest and frank pieces of, pieces of advice that might be given and that might be shared amongst Muslims is that the Muslim woman has to have her identity based upon Islam, based upon what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows to be good for her because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who knows what benefits us and what is good for us and he is the one who knows what harms us and what uh, is bad for us in this life and in the hereafter and nobody else can define and tell you what it means to be a Muslim woman and what you should do or what you, what you shouldn't do how you should be or how you shouldn't be no one else but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the creator of men and women and the creator of everything, he is the one who knows. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah ya'lamu man khalaq. Does not Allah know those he created? Wa huwa latiful khabir. And he is the one who has knowledge of all things. He is the most knowledgeable. He is the one who knows all things. So if Allah, the first thing that the Muslim uh, generally as a man or a woman has to act, uh, would agree and accept and r reminds themselves is that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and what his messenger alayhi salatu wasalam said is the truth. Whether it be in terms of the beliefs that we hold, whether it be in terms of the morals and ethics that we have, the behavior, our dress code, our way of speaking, our way of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our way of behaving, how we interact with other people, all of this, the Muslim who believes in Allah in the last day and the one who wants to be successful and happy in this life and in the hereafter, uh, puts as his priority or as her priority the message and the teachings of her deen, her religion, and she puts that in front and above everything else. So, one of the keys to this, or to being successful in this area, is knowledge. And we can never emphasize enough that Muslims in general are in need of being educated and knowledgeable about their religion, about their deen, and about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us as guidance. And this is even more important uh, at a time or in places where there are lots of misunderstandings about Islam, not least in the area of the identity and behavior of Muslim women. And Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wassalam told us طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم Seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim And this includes women It includes women And in fact it's very important for women to study their religion and contrary to what people would have you believe or what many people would have, have you believe that as Muslims we try to keep the women ignorant rather the opposite is the truth 
and the opposite is what should be done and that is that we should be encouraging the Muslim woman whether that be our mother or our sister or our wife or our daughter we need to be encouraging the Muslim woman to be more educated about her religion because this involves or this results in a number of great benefits the first of them is the benefit that any Muslim will gain through knowledge and that is the ability to know how to live your life in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remember that we said at taqwa requires a degree of knowledge you have to know what is right and what is wrong according to the deen of Allah in order to be able to do what is right and avoid what is wrong and if you want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfill the purpose for what you were created then and that is to obey Allah and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and not to worship anyone or anything besides Allah azza wa jal and this requires a degree of knowledge and of course that does not mean that everyone is required to be a scholar it does not mean that everyone is required to be an expert in every single aspect of Islam and in every single area of uh, Islamic law what it means is that you need to be educated enough to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala correctly and to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and, and avoid a shirk Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that he created the man, he created the jinn and created mankind to worship him alone and so in order to fulfill this purpose to fulfill this goal a certain degree of knowledge and study and education is needed and in addition to this, the Muslim woman will benefit uh, in terms of knowing her rights and her duties and knowing what her true rights and true duties are and what is truly good for her and what is really bad for her in the midst of two extremes. The first extreme is the extreme of those who would who do not give the Muslim woman her rights or who are unjust to the Muslim woman for example uh, uh, amongst the Muslims amongst ignorant Muslims there is a problem that in some cultures and societies the Muslim woman isn't always given her rights or she is treated as a second-class citizen due to ignorance due to some cultural heritage for whatever reason the Muslim woman who's educated and knows about her deen and knows what her rights are and knows what her duties are uh, will not fall pray or will not uh, you know be confused or be uh, or will be less likely to take injustice or to be used and abused in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not order and in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have us treat the women of our families and our societies and the second extreme or the other extreme is the extreme of telling people that they can do anything they want they can behave what, however they want and it's just a matter of personal choice and that a person should not be restricted in any way by the regulations of Islam rather we should be free and we should have the freedom to choose what we want to do and what we don't want to do and some 
would have the Muslim woman believe that this is something that is good for her. That this is something that is good for anyone and everyone. And this is a ridiculous position to take since we know that as humans we don't know everything that is good for us. And we often make mistakes. We often do things that are harmful to us thinking that they are good for us or thinking that it's just a matter of enjoying yourself, it's just a matter of personal choice. But the blessing that is upon the Muslim Ummah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to them guidance that helps them to lead helps them to lead wholesome, healthy, safe lives where they can fulfill their potentials as a man or a woman without being confused and without being led astray and without being uh, uh, used and abused by anyone else. And that this requires rules and regulations. This requires laws. This requires that we confine ourselves and our behavior, whether men or women, to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed for us and to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to practice and how he has commanded us to behave and that we stay away from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us is harmful to us and involves disobedience to him, azza wa jal. And so, in order to avoid or in order to be saved from these two extremes, uh, the Muslim woman would do well to educate herself and to strive to know Islam from its pure sources, from the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, as understood and explained and practiced by the earliest Muslims, the Salaf al-Salih, the righteous predecessors, who included the great men and women of Islam. And so we take those great men and women of Islam, the Sahaba, the companions, as examples and as models, role models, to see how Islam and how uh, the teachings of Islam can be implemented and how they benefit a person in their personal, family and social life. So, the Muslim woman should involve herself and should be busy in trying to learn for herself, for her own benefit, in order to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to stay obedient to Allah and in order to know what is the right path for her and stay away from the extremes of total uh, you know uh, being totally uh, oppressed and suppressed and not able to fulfill your potential as a Muslim and from the other extreme of being left without guidance and told that this freedom and this personal choice of how you behave, how you live your life, what you do, what you don't do, that this is the solution to all problems and this is what happiness means and so on and so forth. This hasn't really actually benefited anyone, hasn't benefited any society. The third great benefit from studying and from knowing your religion and being involved in knowledge is that you will be more equipped, better equipped as the first teacher and educator of your children, of those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed under your charge and under your responsibility as a mother, as a wife, as an older sister or whatever. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْعُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ 
فالرجل راع في بيته أو في أهله Everyone is a shepherd. Everyone is a shepherd responsible for some people. And all of you are, going, are responsible and will be questioned about your flock. The man is the shepherd over his household, his family. And he will be asked and he is responsible for how he deals with them and how he guides them and how he uh, conducts himself and with regards to them. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that the woman وَالْمَرْأَةُ مَسْؤُولَةٌ The woman is also responsible. She is also a shepherd. وَالْمَرْأَةُ رَاعٍ The woman is also a shepherd and she is responsible for her flock and she will be asked about her flock. She is responsible over the house of her husband and his children and she will be asked about these matters. And the first teacher, the first educator that that Muslim child has is his mother. And that is a great responsibility. It's a great, um, it's a great honor. And it's a great responsibility. And again, here, the, this kind of clash of cultures and this uh, constant kind of pressure upon the Muslim woman exists, particularly in the West, that she should not be responsible for her children and she should not be responsible for the household and she should not play her part as a member of the family. Rather, she should be free to choose what she wants to do and where she wants to go and how she wants to behave. And that in fact, and this is one of the things that is most, was one of the most absurd things that we hear or that we, the, uh, one of the most absurd messages that we get in the West, and that is to be a member of the family, to be a person who is a homemaker, to be the first educator of generations of people that start with one's children. This is a worthless and it's a low uh, kind of position to have. This is one of the most absurd things that you can hear today. And this kind of thinking, unfortunately, has got into the minds of, mes of many people, among, many Muslims themselves, as a result of the environments they live in and as a result of their ignorance and their lack of thinking these matters through and just absorbing everything that is thrown at them. So you even hear Muslim women, you even hear sisters undermining the importance of a Muslim woman being at home, teaching her children, looking after her family to such a degree that the Muslim woman is often left thinking, well, you know, I'm good. I can only be successful and I can only make a name for myself and only have any respect if I get rid of my family responsibilities and I go out and I try to be a man in society. And you're only worth anything if you have a job, if you have a position, if you have a title, if you have such and such money in your bank account. But if you are a homemaker, if you are a mother, if you are the one who actually is going to build and construct generations to come, well, that's not really worth anything. Working in an office, working in a shop, working in a company, 
is more prestigious and more worthwhile than looking after and educating generations of people to come because you're educating and you're cultivating your children. Objectively, if you look at this objectively, it's a ridiculous concept. And in fact, there is no job. I can quite confidently say there is no job. There is no position. There's no title which is more of a challenge and at the same time more prestigious and more honorable than being responsible for the cultivation of one's children who are going to grow up to be the men and women of the society and have being an influence upon the society in this way is is much more effective and is much more an effective way to make a positive contribution to your family and to your society and to your people than anything else a woman could do. And there's nothing more difficult than that either. There's nothing more challenging than that. If a woman truly wants a challenge, if she really wants to prove herself, then don't run away from the home. That's running away from the challenge. It's easy to go out and to leave family responsibilities and to think that you can make a name for yourself working at some other place when you have no need to do so or, the, or, or for this purpose. We're not talking about situations where someone needs to work, where someone needs to go out and do other things. We're talking about having this negative attitude towards the family, having a negative attitude towards one's responsibilities as a mother and as a wife, as if this means nothing, it's worthless. It's worthless amongst people who don't have any regard, who don't have any higher goals, whose goals are only to eat and drink and sleep and enjoy themselves on the weekend. Of course, for that kind of person, that person with the excuse of trying to, you know, break away from tradition and break away from being confined to a particular role. It's easy, you know, for those type of people, yes, it's useless for them. To, why would they want to put themselves in such a situation where they have such a great responsibility and where they have such an important role to play? They don't want to play that important role. And they don't want the Muslim woman to play that important role. One of the documented and one of the uh, ma'roof, one of the known uh, dangers upon the Muslims and one of the first targets in order to weaken the Muslims is to target the women. And this has actually been stated. This has actually been stated by those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided after they were the enemies of Islam. That one of the first targets that are targeted for, uh, amongst those people who, who want to keep the Muslims weak, who want to keep Muslims held back, one of the first targets is the woman, the Muslim woman. If you can manage to keep her away from her responsibilities, to break her free and kick her out into the street such that she has no time or she has no, not, not, even, not even any desire or wish to fulfill this honorable and this essential role of being a mother and being a wife. If you manage to do that, then you can, of course, make a weak society. You can make a weak Muslim society where the children, where the men, don't really have support, education, tarbiyah, cultivation, personality, morals and ethics. Because these things, first and foremost, come from the family. So there's a great responsibility on the Muslim man, as a husband, as a father, that he provides this environment and he provides this uh, ethos in which people 
can be cultivated upon the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They know for sure what is good for them. They know what is bad for them. They know what to do in life. They have direction. They have goals. And goals and, and, and uh, aspirations that are of benefit to them. They will be of benefit. They're constructive. And the woman plays an essential role in that. But others would have you believe that this, all of this is worthless. All of this doesn't really matter. If you want to do it, you do it. And if you do it, you're somehow backwards. And even amongst Muslim women you hear this or you see this attitude. That if there's a sister who is dedicated to her family. She's not interested in going about the streets. Rather she's interested in cultivating her children, staying at home, being a homemaker. Even other Muslim women, even some sisters, they will look upon that woman as if she's, you know, miskina, she's poor. She's a poor woman. Or she's somehow held back and she's not really she's not really with it. Whereas the woman who goes out and works in a shop or goes out and works in an office in front of a desk, or goes out and mixes with men, she's somehow at a more advanced stage in her life. Or she's somehow luckier. And this is, again, this is a sickness and a kind of uh, silly attitude which has crept up upon the Muslim women because of the environment that they live in, because of what they're constantly being told. And again, what's the, what's the solution? What's the escape from this? The escape from this is that you should be confident with the knowledge that you have about your deen and the benefit of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfilling your role, whether you're a Muslim man or a Muslim woman. And have that confidence. Be proud about, with your Islam. And don't always be apologetic. Because actually, as a Muslim, the, Mus- the, 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 the Muslim's way of life is superior. Is actually superior. It's not something that we should be ashamed of or something that we should be apologetic about. It's actually a superior, a wholesome, a healthy, a beneficial way of life. In this life, before the hereafter. And in the hereafter, it results in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in ultimate success in paradise. But even before that time, even before that inevitable time, the hereafter, in this world and in this life, there is nothing more fulfilling than, for, than, uh, than meeting your obligations and your duties in building your family. And there's nothing more prestigious and more honorable than this. And in fact, if you want to talk about challenges, there's nothing more difficult and more challenging than this. And any mother, any responsible mother, any responsible wife will tell you that that's the case. So one of the things that we saw that happened amongst sisters and that, that comes in waves is that there are times when many of the sisters, many of the Muslim women, many of the uh, girls, Muslim girls, our younger sisters, they go through stages or they go through times when, of course, they are bombarded with this idea that you have to be, to be, to be worth anything, you have to be totally free and you have to be silly and do anything you want to do. And basically don't confine yourself to a family life. And your goal should be becoming such and such person in such and such company, getting that position. And that's what, that's what spells success for you. A life of being used by other men and having to please other men and having to, uh, compromise your, uh, honor and compromise your, um, appearance and compromise your, you know, uh, your, your, your respectability. And in this lies success. And sometimes Muslim women, through education, through learning, they rise above that and they can kind of counter that and go beyond that. And at times you find even amongst sisters, even, even amongst those who call themselves practicing sisters, whatever that means, even though that term is not really a correct term, practicing Muslim and non-practicing Muslim, there's no such thing. A Muslim is a Muslim, and everything that is obligatory upon one Muslim is obligatory upon another Muslim, and everything that is haram for one Muslim to do is haram for another Muslim to do. The laws, the rules, the regulations are the same. And every Muslim is supposed to be a practicing Muslim. But even the, even some of those who are regarded or may regard themselves as practicing Muslims, 
they fall into this, often because of the society, often because of the background, often because of what we've been brought up upon. And it's one of the most difficult areas or one of the most challenging areas. And that's why, you know, we're spending some time reminding our sisters upon this, about this. Now, you have to break away from that. This is a sincere advice. You have to break away from that and you have to understand and know what is beneficial from you and that you have in front of you the, gu- the guidance and the, the uh, uh, instruction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not from anyone else, not from any other man. Not from any other uh, group of people who want to uh, influence you or who want to benefit you uh, or harm you or who, who are experimenting with you. As a Muslim woman, you're not an experiment. You're not some, you, you don't have to uh, go through life trial and error, making a mistake here, being used here, being abused there, all in the name of trying to make something of yourself. The six, what is success and what is uh, honor and what is respect is already in front of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided you to that. So be confident and take that and choose that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes mankind for turning away from guidance and choosing what is less. And this is something that a Muslim woman has to think for herself. Am I choosing something which is worse for me by moving away from my roles and responsibilities as a Muslim woman? Whether those be my personal responsibilities about how I conduct myself, how I dress, how I look, my hijab, my uh, behavior, my speech, or whether it be my family, my position in the family and in the society. Do I, want, do I want to have that honorable position of being uh, uh, the righteous wife, uh, a righteous mother, an educator, a homemaker? I mean, I don't find this anything more honorable than that. If a teacher, and every society knows, and every society respects a teacher, every society respects a doctor, every society knows the importance of someone who has the power and the ability and the knowledge and the will and the patience to heal other people, to educate them. And if we do that with teachers, and if we do that with doctors, and if we say that about leaders, then the mother and the wife is all of those in one. So how is it that being a mother and being a wife is somehow, you know, uh, less of a respectable thing. When you're a mother, as the sisters who are mothers will know, you're a doctor, you're a teacher, you're a headmistress, you're a manager, you are uh, a manager of your house, you, you involve yourself in the finances of your husband's money and the wealth that you own and the wealth that you uh, have to spend. You have to be careful about what you spend. You have to be careful about what you save. You have to be, uh, you know, responsible financially. You're a teacher. You cultivate. You're a big influence on your children, upon your husband. Uh, You're a doctor. You're a nurse. When your children are sick, when there are health concerns, when you have to look after your health and the health of your family. Your, um, your, uh, anything you want to say, any, anything which is responsible and anything which is uh, important as a, as a role and anything that we might put a label on outside of the house as a job, as a position, well, you've got that already. You have those responsibilities and you have the honor and the privilege and the status of that already. So why would we undermine that and go to something else? So the Muslim women really need to be, uh, the sisters really need to sort of remind themselves of this and advise each other in this area and praise or uh, respect that kind of role and that kind of position and be proud of that. Uh, if, you're, if you're in that position or if you're trying to fulfill those responsibilities, be proud of it, be happy with it. Because this is what is going to be successful. And that is why, because this is so challenging, because this is so important, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
made this kind of life that the the jihad the, the the struggle of the woman and he made it a uh, an uh, one of the doors or one of the ways that a woman's going to enter jannah that if uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that if a woman she prays her prayers she fasts she does those basic obligations which are common for all Muslims and she obeys her husband. She can enter into Jannah from whichever of its doors she wishes, from whichever of the gates she wants. So, this is one area, the woman's role in society, in family, what, how she makes her choices for our sisters, for our younger sisters, for our older sisters, whoever they are. You need to be very aware that you are a target and that there are groups of people who are fighting over you and fighting for your heart and fighting for your mind. One group doesn't actually want any good for you. They just want to be, a, or they, they're misguided and think that they're helping you because they have a set of values, they have a set of uh, wishes and wants, you know, that they think is going to be good for you. But... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam and the Muslim scholars and the Muslim men who are responsible and who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they want good for you and they pass on to you and they are not afraid for you to be educated in your religion and if you are educated in your religion you can make that choice and you can see really where the where uh, benefit where honor and where uh, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lies if that's what you want but if a person just like a man doesn't really care about these matters then they will do what they wish as, as Allah's messenger alayhi salatu wasalam said that one of the things that people have inherited and one of the things that they have taken from the words of the prophethood the previous prophets إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتْ if you have no shame if you have no haya then do as you wish. Just like a man, you say to a woman, do as you wish. But if you are really actually sincere in your concern for yourself, if you have self-respect, and if you want to be successful, because the greatest self-respect is that you do not want yourself, your soul, to enter the fire. And you do not want yourself to be used and abused by people who have no right upon you. So if you truly respect yourself as a woman, then obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that lies success and happiness and safety and security in this life, inshallah ta'ala, and in the hereafter. But if you don't have any haya, if you don't have any, you know, you don't really care. You don't really care what you do and what you say. You don't care what, uh, what your actions result in. Fasna ma'ashit. Do what you want. Do what you want. You are a free woman at the end of the day. You're in a society that will support you in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one's going to force you to do anything. If you want to disobey Allah azza wa jal, if you want to go to the hellfire, you're free to do so. You have that freedom, mashallah. So, the, our sisters should remember this and should take the time to think about these matters rather than be concerned about you know, just uh, mundane, small, useless affairs. One of the pieces of advice that any Muslim would do well to receive, and maybe we'll, you know, we'll make this the last sort of thing that we deal with, is, uh, and this applies to the Muslim woman as much as the man, is that a person should look at the um, the weaknesses that he or she has and deal with them in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to and enabled us human beings, as humans, we have certain weaknesses we have certain things that we tend to do Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us uh, that humans, m mankind was created ignorant and unfair, unjust and that we came from the bellies, we came from the wombs of our mothers, and we don't know anything. 
this is something which is common to all, all people. And so what is it upon a person to do? A, a person, therefore, tries to reduce the weakness by educating themselves, by learning how to be fair and how to be just, and by trying to basically overcome the limitations or the human weaknesses that we have. So it is also true that there are some traits and some qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I emphasize again that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created you, who knows the most about you more than you know about yourself, there are some traits and qualities that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointed out when he had the chance, when he had the occasion to do so with regards to, to, to the woman. And the woman who is truly concerned for her own success and salvation is the one who is going to take this on board and is going to try to better herself and try to improve herself or try to, you know, be a, uh, a key or be a way to good rather than a way to evil. As occurs in some of the narrations that you should always try to be a key, a good... Uh, a key to the door of good. Always try to open up ways that lead to good and try to be a lock on the door of evil. So there are certain traits that the Prophet ﷺ told us about that the Muslim woman has to, uh, as a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should overcome, try to overcome and try to resist. And there are practical things that you can do and there are also there is also a degree of honesty that is needed in this area and again the society that you live in the culture that you live in does not help in this regard so if i say to you that you sisters not you sisters you women will be the majority of the people of the hellfire how does that make you feel? How does it make you feel? Because this is not something that any other man said. It was something that Allah's Messenger والسلام, told you. And was this done or was this said in order to put you down? In order to make you a second class citizen? in order to disrespect you? No. The problem is, is that as soon, and this is again an issue which is not particular to woman, it's, it's something which is, you know, part of the culture, Western culture in general, is that if, if that people don't like being told anything that is, you know, personally offensive or personally is can be viewed to put your status down. And so we have this concept of political correctness whereby we're not supposed to say anything to anyone that, you know, shows some kind of in, in, inequality in any way whatsoever. And most, a lot of the time it's correct. A lot of the time it's correct that we shouldn't say certain things to put certain people down but this goes too far in the society that we live in, in the culture that we live in, such that now you can't say anything, you can't say anything even as an advice, even as a statement of truth, even as a, a general principle in order to point out that someone needs to do something about it. So for example, if someone says, oh, you know, the women are going to be the majority of the people of hellfire. What happens in this society or what happens if you're a person who doesn't, who's not really concerned, who doesn't really believe in hellfire and paradise, who doesn't really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last day? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? The first thing that comes to your mind is, oh, you know, I'm being put down. And so uh, Western society would have you believe that this is a sexist statement. It's a sexism. And according to their um, 
you know, according to their standards, according to the way that they, uh, you know, behave and the, and, the, and the things that they set up for themselves and according to the lies that they tell themselves, it is. Islam is sexist in that way. We're not going to pretend, we're not going to fall into a trap where we pretend and we say, no, we deny these things about Islam or we try to explain them away. But what is the attitude of a person now who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows that there's hellfire and there's paradise? If the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me that I belong to a group of people who have a certain trait, or who have a propensity, who have a, who ha- there's a possibility that he could lead me to be from those majority of people who are going to go to the hellfire. What's the first thing I should think? Let's take away, let's remove the issue of woman and man here. Let's just say I belong to a group of people. I belong to a group of people. There's a trait amongst us. There's a possibility. It doesn't mean that every single person has it, but there's a possibility and a trait that would send me to the hellfire. What should I think? Is the first thing that I think, oh, why is so-and-so saying this about me? Why is someone talking about me like this? Or should it be, oh, hold on, what is the trait and how can I avoid it so I don't go to the hellfire? Because that's why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it. And this is one example. And upon this, you you as the Muslim woman needs to think, you need to think, what's your attitude towards anything like this? It's not just this issue. What's the attitude? Do I treat what comes in the book and the sunnah with regards to me as a woman? Do I treat it the same as I would treat the speech of any man, of any normal man who just happens to say something which I find offensive? Is that what is that how is that what it's come down to now? That either we have to explain it away, or we have to become apologetic about it, or we have to deny it, or we reject Islam and we reject the teachings of Islam and say, I'm not having any of that. Of course that's a ridiculous attitude to take. If someone says you might be going to the hellfire if you do a certain thing and if you behave in a certain way. You know, you're in big trouble if your reaction is, well, you shouldn't be speaking about me like that. The intelligent person, man or woman, is going to say, oh, hold on, what, what, what is the problem? What is it that might send me to the hellfire? Let me see if I can fix this within myself or avoid it and be safe from it. So one Eid, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave the Eid khutbah as in the hadith in Al-Bukhari and other collections of hadith. And he spoke and uh, exhorted the Muslims. And then when walking back, uh, because the women are in their separate section, listening to the exhortation, listening to the khutbah, taking part in the Eid themselves, as the Prophet ﷺ commanded, and as he instructed that all the women should come out to the Eid, as well as the men. And even the woman who is not praying, the woman who's on her menses, she should come out for the Eid, except that she should stay away from where the prayer is done and she doesn't take part in the prayers because she's not praying at the time. But in order to hear the good, in order to hear the khayr, in order to take part in the exhortation that the Imam gives to the Muslims on the occasion of them coming together for the Eid, The Muslim woman has been strongly encouraged to come out to the Eid prayer even if she's not praying. So when walking back, the Prophet stopped and gave a special speech, exhortation to the women. After the Eid khutbah, he gave a special exhortation to the women. And he said, Ya ma'ashara nisa, tasaddaqna. فَإِنِّي رَأَيْتُ كُنَّ أَكْثَرَ أَهْلِ النَّارِ أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام He said, O oh women, give in charity. Do sadaqah. For I saw the majority of the people of the fire 
from you, meaning being women. Sahib, who, who said this? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said it. Wasn't, wasn't any other man. The one who is as-sadiq al-masduq. The one who speaks the truth. Who never lied in his life. And the one who is believed because his khabar, his news and his information is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said this. The one who saw paradise and who saw the hellfire. Who was shown in this dunya, before he, were, before he passed away, before he was taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya, showed him paradise and showed him the hellfire. As occurs in a number of hadith, the Prophet sallallahu physically saw what is in the hellfire. When he was making salah, once when he was praying, the Muslims noticed, the, the Sahaba noticed that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam seemed to be perturbed, or he seemed to be moving back from something. And when he was asked about it, he explained that he was shown the hellfire in front of him. And so, one of the things, as a mercy, as a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa taala. That Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam told us. He told us about many things. He told us about many kinds of punishments. Many kinds of things that would happen in the hellfire. For people who did certain types of sins. Men and women. One piece of information that we have been blessed to have. And that you sisters. You Muslim women have been blessed to have in this life before you die. Is that. Because of a certain type of sin, because of a certain type of attitude, not because you're a woman, not without reason, but because of a, if you do, a, if you have a certain type of attitude, this could lead you to be one of those majority inhabitants of the hellfire. This is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. Because you know it now before it's too late. So what was the attitude? What was the response from the women, the Sahabiyat, the Muslim women? What was the attitude? Was it, how dare anyone speak about me like this? Why are we being classified? Why is there a sexist comment being made? Why are we being, why is this generalization being made? And this is the problem we have. We have this attitude in this day and age where we think that any generalization is wrong. Where did you learn this from? Who taught you this? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Imanu Yamaniya. Iman, faith, is Yemeni. This was a generalization. Is every person from Yemen a believer? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that Allah chose the Quraysh. Allah chose the Quraysh tribe from amongst all of the Arabs, the children of Ismail. And from amongst the Quraysh, he, cho- he chose the Bani Hashim. The tribe that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was from. Does this mean that everyone in the Quraysh is a believer and is of the best of the people? What happened to Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِنِّي رَأَيْتُ كُنَّ أَكْثَرَ أَهْلِ النَّارِ I saw you women being the majority of the people of the hellfire. Does it mean that every woman or any woman, just because she's a woman, is going to enter the hellfire? Or that she's somehow worse than a man in this regard? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I have not seen such naqisat al-aql wa deen I have not seen such defective people in regards to their aql and their deen, like, these, like you women, doing away or making the firmly resolved intelligent man go crazy. Describing the attitude 
of many of the women with regards to their husbands, with regards to their family members, their fathers, their brothers. Al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma taraktu ba'di fitnatun adarru, fitnatan adarra ala rijali min al nisa. I have, not, I have not left behind me any fitna, any trial and tribulation more harmful or worse to the men than the women. Faith, does that mean every woman is a, is a bad fitna for every man? So we have to understand the language and the intent in these nusus in these texts of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and I can't in this period of time or in this uh, nasiha or in this talk explain or, or, or talk about the details of every single thing. But what I want, what the, the take-home message for the sisters is, you have to understand Islam first. You have to understand these texts. You have to contextualize and you have to understand what is the meaning and purpose behind these kind of things rather than be uh, full prey to the propaganda and to the ignorance and the shubuhat and the misunderstandings and false beliefs that are propagated by these two extremes that I spoke about. The extreme of those amongst the Muslims who would have the Muslim woman treated as a second class citizen, as if she's worth, worth nothing. That don't even allow the Muslim woman to come to the masjid. Or that think that the best thing for a Muslim woman is that she stays ignorant. There are amongst the Muslims those who have these kind of attitudes. And also to escape that other extreme who would say, look, Islam oppresses you as a woman. And it makes you out to be a second class citizen. My question to you is, are you going to treat the nusus, the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah, in this manner? So what was the meaning? What was the attitude? What was the response? Let's go back to the Eid Salah. What was the response? The Hadith tells us a woman, and in one narration, a woman who had dark cheeks, she stood up. And she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, and why is that? Why is that? She didn't say, how, how could you say such a thing? Why are you saying such a hurtful thing? Why are you saying something which is not politically correct? Why are you hurting our feelings? La, what was the response? A messenger of Allah. Why is that? Why is that? So the concern now is, what's the reason that the Prophet ﷺ gave us this warning and that he told us, he gave us a solution or he, made, he, he pointed us women to uh, try to counter or try to strengthen ourselves by giving sadaqah, by giving charity. And we know what happened. All the sisters will know what happened in this situation. What was the response of the women? Is that the women started to take off their earrings and their jewelry and started to give them in charity straight away the gold that they had, the, the jewelry that they were wearing. They started taking them off on the spot and giving them in charity. That was the response. So what was the question? The question from this woman, this Sahabiya radiallahu ta'ala anha was, why is that O Messenger of Allah? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa of course he knew that he's going to explain this. He's going to give the reason as a nasiha, as a warning. He said, takfurna al-ashir. You're constantly ungrateful to the one who lives with you, your husband. Ungrateful. You make kufr. Takfurna al-ashir. This word kufr, when it's qualified in this way, means, it doesn't mean unbelief, it means being ungrateful for something. Kufr and ni'mah in Islamic terminology means when you deny or when you are ungrateful for something good that is done to you. And this is a trait. This is a trait amongst women. Except those who rise above and who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables to overcome this attitude. And the Prophet sallallahu explained, a person will do good, will live 
his whole life with his wife, and if she's uh, if she's not pleased with him for one day or one one situation, one argument, she'll turn around and say, "I've never had anything good from you." Now ask yourselves, as women who know other women, do you deny this? Do you deny that this is a trait that is prevalent amongst many women? This ingratitude can lead to even greater things. First and foremost, you get this attitude where a Muslim woman doesn't even know or a woman doesn't know what's good for her. She'll have one mushkila, one problem in her life. She'll have an argument, a fight with her husband. Or her father will be angry with her. And she will be displeased with someone. And she will destroy her whole life and then regret it later. Because she's ungrateful. She can't see what's good. She can't see what's good for her. She can't see that 99%, 80%, 75% of her time with this husband or in this family, is good and is better for her in her religion and in her dunya. She forgets everything that's good about her life and only remembers what is wrong or what has gone sour or what has gone bad in this situation. Do you deny this? Even if you do, Allah's Messenger والسلام, said it. This is what said, will result in the people of the hellfire, that the majority of the population of the hellfire will be from the women. So, the, there's a reason behind it, there's a particular type of sin or attitude that's there. Now, what's the attitude of a Muslim woman? Just like any Muslim, that's why I said in the beginning that as humans we have certain weaknesses, we have certain limitations. We're not born knowledgeable. We don't know the details of Islam. We don't know how to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in detail. We don't know anything. We have a propensity to be unjust and to be selfish. These are human traits that the Muslim, the believer in Allah, overcomes and he corrects himself with. And that's the difference. So whenever you find these negative traits being mentioned in the Qur'an, about humans, you don't find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that about the Muslims or the believers. He says, an insan, the human being, mankind is like this in general. And then the believer is the one who, through his obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his trust in Allah and his belief, the hopes that he has of, of going to Jannah, the belief that he has in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the tawakkul that he has upon Allah, they change his character so that he turns from being unjust to being just. In the same way, as a person, as a, as a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a creation of Allah, the, the woman has been created with certain qualities, certain uh, uh, attitudes that may develop within her, but the believing woman is the one who changes this about herself, or who overcomes this and who covers this fault with the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't just make this criticism and go away. He began by saying, Tasaddaqna, give charity. Give charity. He gave them a way to cover this fault or to make up or strengthen the position by doing something that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that makes them realize what ni'mah, what blessings are. It's no coincidence that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's not a coincidence. Why? Because when you give sadaqah, when you give charity, you recognize the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. And this counters the attitude of being ungrateful. Because Allah, Allah's Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, said, Man la yashkuru nas la yashkuru Allah. The one who does not thank and is not grateful to the people for what they do for him or her, doesn't thank Allah either. One thing leads to another. So, the solution or one of the uh, things that the Messenger of Allah, alayhi put forward for you women, 
is actually a very wise solution. And it's as if, if we wanted to expand and we wanted to expand upon, you know, what would be, what would have been understood by the companions, what would have been understood by the Muslims who were there and who knew the language and who knew the speech of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is telling you, do this thing, this sadaqah, give charity. Because charity, as we know, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, the, uh, charity, a sadaqah, الصدقة تطفئ الذنوب كما يطفئ الماء النار أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. Charity extinguishes one's sins like water extinguishes fire. And likewise, صدقة is a reminder when you give charity. It's a reminder of the blessings of Allah سبحانه وتعالى upon you. You thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى that He has given you these blessings such that you have the ability to give something of what you have away. And so this is very munasib, this is very appropriate to the sin or to the, the problem that the Prophet ﷺ was pointing out, this challenge that is upon the women, is that you are ungrateful people. You have this tendency to be ungrateful. And one of the things we have to understand about generalizations, again, because we come from this politically correct westernized society where we don't make any generalization about anything. If you look in the Quran and the Sunnah, you find lots of generalizations, like some of the examples I gave you. So do we say that Islam is now politically incorrect? Yes, Islam is politically incorrect. But this politics, we don't care about it. So when, when you hear Nasus, you have to think like a Muslim. You have to think as the person who understands the language of the book and the sunnah. And who understands that this information and these instructions and this guidance is coming from the creator of the heavens and the earth. It's not coming from any other society. It's not coming from a cultural bias. It's not coming for, from a male chauvinist. It's not coming from a sexist attitude. This is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that you have a problem, what are you going to do about it? Likewise, with regards to the aql and the deen, when the Prophet sallallahu said, I've never seen such people who have such deficient aql and deen as you women doing away, making a man go crazy, making a rajul al-hazim. A rajul al-hazim is a person who is not just an ordinary man, he's a man who is, has a firm resolve, intelligent, sharp-minded man, driving him crazy. The Prophet showed his, uh, uh, you know, surprise, ta'ajub, his surprise that someone who has in general, as a trait. Again, what are you going to do about it? The Prophet ﷺ is describing women as having a deficiency in their aql. A deficiency in their, their uh, ability to decipher things. It's not saying that women are stupid. It's saying that there is a challenge here, there is a difference. And again, if you are objective about these things, you will only be able to honestly answer and say, yeah, this is the case. And there are many examples that we can give of this. One example is that a woman can be told that if she shows her body and she disrespects herself and she uses or she becomes uh, an object in front of other men, She's free. That means she's free. And I would challenge you to tell any man the same thing and have that man turn around and say, yeah, thank you, you've given me my freedom. Take off your clothes. Disrespect yourself. Constantly try to seek approval and be regarded as being acceptable and beautiful and whatever by the opposite sex of your society. And what we'll do, we'll call that freedom. And we'll have you thank us for it and say that this is a right. This is my right to do this. You try telling any man that this is the case. He will turn around and laugh at you. Except the man who's turned into a woman, as many of the men in the society have now. But you tell a woman this, 
and you tell her enough times and she starts believing it. There's a difference in attitude. There's a difference in the level of aql. And what is aql? What is aql? Aql, as the ulama explain, aql is that ability within a person that stops a person from doing something which is harmful. It's that ability to decipher what is beneficial, what is not beneficial. It doesn't mean just intelligence in general. Again, it's about language of the sharia, understanding the deen, understanding the language, having knowledge. And so, often enough, the Prophet ﷺ pointed out, often enough the woman, she, she has a, 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 a misunderstanding about affairs, she sees things in a way that are not exactly as they are. And there's that deficiency in the aql, and that translates into uh, the example that the Prophet ﷺ gave of the fact that in memory, in terms of me- rem- accurately remembering things, uh, uh, often the woman is... Uh, you know, has uh, a tendency to make mistakes in accurately recalling events and situations, and that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, as an example, when he was said, "And what is the aql? What is the deficiency in her aql?" He said, Are, "Isn't it that two women witnesses are required instead of one man witness?" As Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in the Quran, so that one of them, women, one of the women, can remind the other. They need to uh, they need to corrobor- corroborate and remind each other because often enough, a woman on her own is not able to recall accurately and to remember and to accurately faithfully reproduce her witness or her her account of what happened in the past, and this is something that is a difference. There's a difference there. Now again, we say. This is not something which is absolutely the case with every single woman compared to every other single man. And we have to understand this topic. Now when the Prophet ﷺ said this, that women are like this, or men are like this, or that women have this challenge, it doesn't mean that every single woman on the face of the earth has this problem more, or has this challenge, is more challenged in this regard than every other single man. No, that's not the case. This is... These are descriptions of what we call al-jint, the type. It's a general description that this is the case most of the time. But there are exceptions. There are people who go, who are not like this. Or there are people who overcome this because of their iman and their taqwa. But the benefit, what's the benefit? The benefit is that you know that this is a problem in your community. Just like if someone were to, was, was to come along and say, look, in, your, in, in, in such and such community, in such and such community in this part of London or in this part of uh, a particular country, this community has a problem. They have a high crime rate. And they don't succeed in education. Does this mean that every single person in that community is a criminal? And that every single person in that community does, is not able to succeed in education? Nobody would claim that. What's the fa'idah then? What's the benefit of making this generalization? The fa'idah is that we know that there's a problem that exists and that we have to deal with it. Either because we're part of the problem, so we can try and correct ourselves, or that we know that this problem exists so we can help others to get out of the problem. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, women, you know, they're going to be the majority of the people of Hellfire because they are ungrateful to their husbands, it doesn't, it's not saying that every single woman is ungrateful to her husband all the time. It's saying that since you should be aware, it's like the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is what would have been understood by the companions and by the Arab, who knows the language of the book and the sunnah and what it means to generalize and what it means to be specific. He will understand, or she will understand from this, that it's as if the Prophet ﷺ said to you, watch out for this problem. This problem may exist in you, or may exist in your sister. So if you see it in you, deal with it and remember where it could lead you. And take the solution and remember the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. And you will be more grateful and you will escape this problem. And you will be free of this sin. And if you see it in your sister, remind her. If you see it in a situation, in a family situation, try to uh, be a cause for rectifying the affairs. That's, that's what you should understand from these kind of ahadith. Not that anyone is 
putting you down or not that anyone is because people will come to you and tell you look this is how what Islam says about women this is what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said about women and if you don't understand it if you don't have knowledge if you're not educated and if you have a weakness in your iman like many Muslim women or women who are Muslim by name or whatever they can't take this stuff so they either have to resort to rejecting what is in the book and in the sunnah because they're not honest with themselves, they're not honest about the issues that face women, they're not honest about reality. So they either have to reject Islam, or they have to try and explain it away and become apologetic, and that leads you into... So you enter into the realms of people who are going to go to the hellfire anyway, because you're rejecting parts of your deen, you're trying to uh, be apologetic about the hadith of the Prophet wasallam or about ayat of the Qur'an, all because of what? Because of your culture, because of you've been taught that this shouldn't be said about women. You've been taught by someone else, by another culture, that, well, this is not appropriate to differentiate between people like this. So my uh, nasiha here, the whole the take-home message, and we've you know, gone on a bit, the take-home message is that you need to be educated. Every Muslim man, every Muslim woman has to be educated about their religion, they have to learn their religion, study it, ask the people of knowledge if you don't know, um, and always approach the book and the sunnah as a person who knows that this is coming from the creator of the heavens and the earth, and what is in it is true. And if there is something that I don't understand, or is something I can't appreciate, then it's due to my misunderstanding. It's due to other people's misunderstanding. It's not due to there being anything wrong in the book and the sunnah. And the biggest target in this regard for the attack and for negative propaganda are the women. You are the targets of people who would have you reject your religion, reject your way of life, and enter into this spiral of constantly trying to, you know, seek respect and seek status in, a, in a, through, through ways that are frankly unjust to you, first and foremost. And are fitna upon the society. And are fitna upon the society. Western society has failed when it comes to family, when it comes to the status of women. They are actually a failure. And you can see it in front of you. You can see it in front of you. And many of the sisters realize this. Many of the, Muslim, many of the women in the society realize this. And they come to Islam because they're honest with themselves and they see... That in reality, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as it speaks truth when it comes to belief and creed about Allah, it speaks the truth when it comes to the problems and solutions for societies, families, individuals, men and women. So it's no coincidence that many women are becoming Muslim. Walillah alhamd. That's because those women are honest with themselves. And they want the truth and they want what's beneficial. And they're not done in by the slogans and the false kind of ideas that the women are brainwashed with constantly day in and day out. That to be someone who is worth anything, you have to be, you have to look a particular way, you have to behave a particular way, you have to uh, compromise your honor, you have to try and be a man, you have to try and compete with men, you have to speak like a man, behave like a man, but at the same time be an object for men to, you know, be pleased with when they look at. And, that's, and that means that you have now become equal with them. Ajeeb, strange. What a strange concept. So my advice to the sisters, to my dear sisters in Islam, is uh, return back to the deen, return back to the book and the sunnah, and practice Islam as it should be understood uh, based upon knowledge, based upon an understanding, based upon a taslim, submission to what the khaliq of the heavens and the earth, what the creator of the heavens and the earth has guided us to. Just like in other, any other area of life, you know, in any other area that a person might have an opinion about or a person may be influenced about, whether, it come, whether it's politics, whether it's work, whether it's finances, whether it's food and drink, whether it's the way we dress. Just like in any other affair of life, we understand that not only has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
revealed rules and regulations, halal and haram. But Allah has made halal for us everything that is good. And everything that is fine for us and wholesome. And Allah has made haram everything that is harmful for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't make things haram and those things are good for us. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obligated upon the women to cover themselves and to dress in a way that men don't have to dress. When he commanded them to have the hijab. When he commanded them to cover their, themselves when they are in public. This is actually good for the woman. Before anyone else is good for the woman. It's of benefit to her. So not only is it an obligation, let's not just see things as obligations and duties and restrictions. And how, all of these things are good for us in this life and in the hereafter. And alhamdulillah, a growing number of women are able to appreciate this and see this through their study. Through, but the biggest thing is honesty. Be honest with yourself. And also you will see with knowledge that... Uh, you know, these matters of what it means to be a Muslim woman, what is my identity, what is my status, what are my duties, what are my rights, all of this becomes clear in a way that the heart of a believer is, you know, in that situation that we all want to be in. Huh? Where the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, ذَاقَ iman the person who has tasted the sweetness of faith is the one who is pleased. الذي رضي بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم نبيا ورسولا. The one who tastes the sweetness of iman, the sweetness of faith, and when that sweetness mixes in the heart, nothing can replace it. The one who tastes this sweetness of Iman and who is the one who is happy with Allah. He's satisfied, happy with Allah as his Lord. He knows that everything that comes from Allah is good and beneficial and everything is, is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a rahmah and a justice. He's pleased with Allah as his Rabb, as his Lord. And he's pleased with Islam as his deen. His Islam is not a cultural thing. It's not something imposed upon him. He's pleased. He's happy with Islam as his deen. He believes it to be the superior way of life. He knows it to be the case. And if everyone on the face of the earth disbelieved, he would stick to his Islam or she would stick to her Islam because she knows what's good for her. And likewise, pleased and satisfied with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the messenger, as the prophet from Allah, as the one who is the leader as the one that we listen to, as the one we obey, as the man that we obey because he is the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam. And that's why the sweetness of Iman means also that you, don't, that you would hate, as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam told us in another hadith in Al-Bukhari, that a person hates to return back to kufr, as he would hate. To be thrown in the fire. You dislike and you hate to be, to be in a situation or to lead a life which is a life outside of the teachings of Islam. In the same way that you would hate and you would dislike to be thrown into the fire. The key to that is first knowledge, education, honesty and at taslim submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Think like a Muslim, because you are a Muslim, whether you are a man or a woman. Think like a Muslim. Don't think and don't judge Islam and the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam and the teachings of Islam. Don't think of them in terms of Western liberalism. Don't think of them in terms of, you know, what the society says. You have to be independent in that regard, because you know that the source of Islam is, Allah, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It comes from Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Other opinions and ideologies and philosophies, these are, these are subject of trial and error and guesswork and the ahwa, the desires of men and women who are, have not been guided by Islam, who have not accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their Lord, have not accepted Allah's messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as a messenger of Allah. 
So they're in jahiliyyah, they're in ignorance. They're in ignorance. All of this is ignorance. Except from what comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. Aqulu hadha, inshallah we'll stop there. We've gone on for long enough inshallah ta'ala. Aqulu hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, that He uh, enables our sisters, the Muslim women, wherever they may be, to uh, be guided by beneficial knowledge and righteous action and that he strengthens our Muslim sisters to rise above the challenges and the problems and the negative attitudes that are thrust upon them or that are directed upon them and the pressure that is put upon the Muslim woman from society, from non-Muslim society and the allegations that are leveled against Muslim women and the disrespect that is given to Muslim women by societies who would have them believe that the Muslim woman, every Muslim woman is stupid and she just accepts being, you know, when she wears that hijab she's been forced. This is one of the most offensive. If you want to talk about people who disrespect you it is those people who say Muslim women are forced to wear hijab Muslim women are forced to remain in the home when we know that hundreds of people are coming to Islam to lead that way of life out of choice when they didn't have to in the middle of England who forced them? who forced them, that sister who covers herself properly and who wears hijab who forced her to wear that hijab? this is one of the biggest lies that are spread. And they're, and they're in denial. They're in denial now. Even if you tell them, I made this choice, they'll tell you, no, you didn't make the choice. Someone forced you. And you're stupid because you were persuaded to do so. That's what I call disrespect. That's what I call putting a person down. That's what I call treating a person as a second class citizen. Where they don't even think that you have the ability to make the choice to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not disobey Allah. Uh, or, and not disobey Him. And they will tell you, even if you tell them, I, uh, I am practicing my religion based upon what I understand and know out of choice. I've made this choice and I'm not doing it for any man. I'm not doing it for anyone else. Someone will turn around and say to you, no, you are. You're doing it because someone forced you to do it. Or some man or some men, you know, have overcome you. And they won't even believe you when you say I did it out of choice. That's what I call disrespect. That's what I call putting a person down. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our sisters and uh, to help aid them and to give them uh, aid and assistance and victory in these difficult circumstances and under all these pressures and all these problems and that he enables our sisters to give in charity and to be less involved with the dunya and more involved with the akhirah, more involved with the hereafter. Aqulu hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.